Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Uh, I would like to welcome you to this uh, new episode of uh, our webinar series called Meet the Specialists. Uh, so my name is Lena Boscovierne and I will be your uh, specialist today. Uh, I'm Food and Applications Manager and uh, I would like to discuss an important uh, step uh, in the baking process that is often not disregarded but uh, uh, not as considered as other step uh, but still which is very important this is the shaping step. Uh, so during this presentation we will discuss uh, why shaping is important, uh, what are the consequences of a proper or improper shaping, and what are the solutions that we can offer to provide a better control over this step. Uh, during the presentation, uh, feel free to use the question, question and answer section uh, in order to ask anything that you want. Uh, no silly questions, please uh, do not hesitate. And I will be uh, happy to try and answer at the end of the presentation. So the presentation should last around 40 minutes and, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. So let's start. So first of all, I would like to give a little bit of context uh, regarding shaping and baking in general. Uh, because if you consider baking, you do not have any process in the world uh, any two processes in the world that are completely similar. Every process is unique. Every process uh, uses different formulations, uh, different uh, machines, different equipments, different operators, different know-how, um, and in the end, to make different final products. So this is very difficult to speak about generalities, but we can try and simplify the baking process in a few um, great steps, main steps. So first of all, you will select and, uh, and weight all of your ingredients that you are going to mix with water in order to create a cohesive dough. You will have it rest, maybe need a second time, uh, and then you will shape it. And basically after hours of, care of careful selection of raw material, mixing, bulk fermentation, et cetera, et cetera, then this is the step where you, where you can get creative. Uh, to make any type of product that you want, any shape of product that you want. It can be round, it can be oblong, it can be a baguette style bread, it can be a pizza, a ciabatta, a focaccia, a bagel, uh, or any shape that are more or less complicated. But basically, shaping is the step that determines, that determines the shape of your bread. Then you will have your uh, bread uh, fermented, proofed, uh, and baked until the final structure of the product is set. Uh, and of course, you will be able to enjoy your final product after a quick step of cooling down. But to give a little bit of introduction about sh shaping, again, this is very complicated to speak about generalities as there are as many techniques as you have of final products. Uh, first of all, shaping bread, no, bread dough is not even mandatory. Uh, you can have some styles of bread, uh, such as ciabatta, that are simply cut and loaded for baking. You have other shapes that are extremely simple. As you can see here on the screen, you have a, a, what is called a, a boule in French. And basically, you just need to make sure that you have a tight outer uh, skin uh, by rolling the dough. Uh, but that's it. Sometimes a correct shaping may require a pre-shaping step uh, plus a resting step some, sometimes or not. This is the case of the baguette where you will first be uh, doing a rectangular shape uh, before really uh, forming your baguette and stretch it in order to uh, reach the lens that, uh, that you need. <coughs> so this is what you can see here. First of all, we are making the shape, shape and then we are stretching it in order to reach the, the adequate lens. Uh, you can have many examples of that. Here, this is for making a bagel. Uh, you also have to go through a pre-shaping step, uh, a rectangular pre-shaping step until uh, you do the final shape. And well, sometimes shaping may require a loaf pan or not. 
Uh, this is the case of the uh, loaf bread. This is the case here of a more complicated shape, such as the brioche à tête. Uh, yes, <laughs> in French. Uh, that requires to make a round tree shape and then a final shape that you will uh, put in a loaf pan in order to keep the shape uh, through uh, baking, through proofing, and then baking. So many different techniques, and and more than that, uh, even if you have, even if you consider only one type of product, here if we consider a croissant, uh, then depending on the countries, depending on the provider, uh, on the baker, you can have different preferences. Uh, the French croissant is not the same as the Greek one, which is not the same as the Ukrainian one or the Italian one, and so obviously if we consider different product like that, this is the same type of product, but different, um, different, different products within these types. And of course, the shaping process is not the same uh, for all of those products, because each baker has its specific technique, works on a specific dough with a certain consistency. Uh, it has its specific feeling that the dough has been correctly shaped or not. Uh, and so all of that will completely impact the process and the quality of the dough and the quality of the final product. So the question becomes, okay, uh, it is, it sounds like a lot of work uh, just to give a shape to a product. Why is it so important? It is so, it is so important because the consumer finds it important. Uh, because yes, shaping allows to obtain the final shape of the product and this is, one of the parameters that is the most important for the consumers. First parameter, well, the main reason for buying a specific bread according to a study that I put here, the reference I put it here, uh, freshness is the, mo is the main uh, parameter, is the most important reason. But appearance, global appearance, arise at the second place. 64% of the final consumers consider the shape the, find the appearance of the product as a reason to buy or not to buy. So a company has every interest to maintain, to choose a shape that works and to maintain the same shape over and over and over, whatever the variation in the quality of the flour or the process or the human um, power. And, and plus, um, the shape, the aesthetic, the global aesthetic of a bread product is a competitive advantage. Like if you are able to design a specific shape, a nice one, uh, an original one, then you can distinguish yourself from the competition. Like if you offer a classical round biscuit or a koala bear biscuit, that is not the same market and that's not the same price. Of course, it's more complicated to make a koala bear but you can also sell it for more money. So on and on, this can be very interesting uh, to consider different shapes. And then the question becomes, okay, it's very important for the final appearance of the product, but is it just about the final appearance of the product? But we know that this is about having a shape uh, with the intention that this shape is retained to some degrees until the dough is completely baked. Uh, but it will directly impact other eating qualities and uh, organoleptic qualities. Like if we take two examples here, the baguette and the miche. Uh, basically, those are two products with the same basic formulation. Uh, it's not very different. Uh, the process is quite similar as well. The shape is the main difference. But here, uh, the shape for the baguette will imply that because it is thin, uh, pointy, uh, stick, uh, shaped like a stick, then it will have a very thin and crispy crust and the maximum crust to crumb ratio, which is the opposite for the mish. It will have, the mish will have a thicker crust with a lower crust to crumb ratio. So then the choice of the product really depends on the consumer preference and on what he wants to do with the bread. And it goes even farther than that, because if we go into details, shaping plays an important role uh, in the quality of the dough and in the quality of the final product, because it has different characteristics. In particular, uh, shaping will create surface tension. 
So here, this is an example uh, where these are the same dose, uh, same mixing process, same formulation, same everything, except that this one has just been stuck in the low fan. This one has been shaped at just a minimum, and this one has been shaped optimally. And, and, and we, can, we can visually see the difference. Uh, when you shape the dough, you will create, you will stretch the outer part of the dough and create surface tension. And by doing that, you will create some sort of a skin of gluten uh, on the surface of the dough. And this skin is very important as it will help the dough to create an even exterior during the baking process uh, to prevent it from collapsing or breaking apart in the oven. So very important role. Also, when you do shaping, you will deflate the dough and compress the gas bubbles. And by doing that, well, you will create a more structured, uh, cohesive crumb. Uh, here, those are the breads that have been done using those doughs. And you can see that with the one that has been optimally shaped, you can see a, so some of a swirling pattern, a swirl pattern uh, that is very uh, characteristic of a of a dough having been uh, shaped optimally. Uh, also, you can notice that the crumb is well structured. There are no large holes or very small ones, contrary to this one that has not been shaped, where it's a little bit more disorganized. And then shaping also has the impact that uh, it can help creating a good crust, a beautiful crust, if you will. Like because of the skin that you have formed, the exterior of the product is more or less um, smooth. And here, since it has not been uh, stretched um, shapes, well, you have the presence of cracks. And here you can also see big bubbles in the surface because it has not properly been deflating. And so when you do a proper shaping in the end, you should have a crust that is smoother, thinner, crispier, and more uniform than for a product uh, from which the dough has not been shaped. So many important aspects uh, in shaping in the end, not so obvious, but important. And that will have a lot of consequences. A lot of consequences. Like if you don't do any shaping, basically for the dough, you might have a slack dough that can be difficult to handle. Uh, and that will result in a final product with an uneven volume and coloration and an unstructured crumb, as we have seen, that can be too thick. On the contrary, if you do a very intense shaping without a proper resting phase, then you can stress out the gluten too much uh, in surface. And then you will create a very stiff dough showing possible tearings like that uh, in surface. And that can result to a low volume because of these stirrings, the gluten is not able to resist deformation during proofing and uh, oven spring during baking. And so because of those stirrings, then you might have a low volume in the end due to collapse during the oven spring or during proofing. And that results also in a very dense scrub. So we can see that um, shaping has direct consequences on the quality of the dough and on the quality of the final product. So how do we control that? Well, we control that by knowing what can have an impact uh, on this step. And basically, a lot of different aspects can impact the shaping characteristic. You have, of course, the uh, external uh, parameters, such as the temperature or the humidity. Like uh, if you try to shape uh, baguette dough at uh, 40 degrees Celsius in the middle of summer in Texas, or uh, in the winter uh, in Paris at uh, 15 degrees Celsius, that are not the same challenges. Then of course, the type of instruments that you are using, it can be a sheeter, a laminating um, device, it can be a roller, it can be many different uh, equipment. You have many on the market and all of them, they have their own uh, challenges and their own constraints. Um, and well, we are not bakers, so we cannot really tell you what kind of sheeter to use, or uh, this is not really not the point. And I won't even tell you what type of flour to use, but we know that flour quality also uh, has a direct impact on shaping, such as the other ingredients. 
Um, but we can focus on what we know. And basically what we know comes from the dough. And when we look at the dough, uh, there are different important characteristics uh, that will allow for proper shaping or not. And when we try to list those characteristics, there are not so many. First of all, you have the fact that the dough should not, must not be sticky. As stickiness is the least desired property given the operational and cleaning issues that the bakery has to deal with, in the word of the website Bakerpedia. So the dough should not be sticky. That's the first thing. Then we know that uh, the tenacity of the dough, uh, its capacity to resist deformation, should play a major role. That's quite obvious, but I will come back to all of that uh, in greater details. Then we know that the dough must be extensible. It must be able to stretch without breaking during uh, then proofing and baking. It should be able to, to maintain uh, its, uh, its shape without breaking. And with a controlled elasticity. So elasticity and extensibility are really two different things. Uh, the elasticity refers to the ab ability of the dough to regain its original shape after, uh, after deformation. So it's the ability of the dough to spring back when it is stretched, which also uh, will impact the shaping step a lot. When we look at those attributes, uh, actually, we know that they are greatly impacted by the flower quality. And when it comes to controlling uh, flower quality, then we can really be of help. This is where we have solutions, and this is the solutions that I would like to present today. So let's start with stickiness. Stickiness, the least desired property during shaping, because, well, because this is obvious, because excessive stickiness has direct impacts, important impacts on the production and on the cost of productions. Uh, it can cause products to be deformed, and so obviously the shape will not be good. Uh, it can cause, uh, it can mean that we will have to use more release agents to avoid stickiness, which has an additional cost. Uh, in the worst case, uh, we might have to stop the line in order to clean it, which is clearly not good uh, for, a, for a proper uh, production. And, and, and yeah, uh, worst case scenario, uh, if the dough, if you have some dough left in some difficult part uh, to access, uh, well, you, it can lead to the potential sanitary issues to mold development, bacterial development, uh, which is something that we should avoid at all costs. So the question becomes, why is the dough becoming sticky? Where the stickiness is coming from? Well, it is actually explained by the fact that you add water during the uh, mixing part. And the part of this water that has been added is actually leaking out of the dough. It's not retained by the dough anymore. So it's free water. And this is why the dough is becoming sticky and sticking to everything. And then we, we can ask ourselves, why is the water leaking out uh, of the dough? Well, it's because we actually have added too much during mixing and we are not able, the flour is not able to retain it inside during the rest of the test when it is stressed by the action of mixing, by uh, other action, by the action of sh shaping, it can leak out. And why does this happen? Well, it's because the absorption of the water is due to too much damage touch and a weak balance with protein. So I will come back to that a little bit more uh, in details, but basically, it is because of a balance of an improper balance between damaged starch and protein. So protein, that's okay. Gluten, uh, we all approximately know what it is, but what about damaged starch? So damaged starch actually comes from the starch. Uh, when you consider a wheat kernel, uh, starch is actually the main component of that. And it's the main component of flour. It's around 70% uh, in flour. And in the wheat kernel, starch is organized in the shape of granules, intact uh, granules. And when you mill the grain, then you will produce damaged starch like that. And this amount of damaged starch that you produce will depend on uh, genetic characteristics of the wheat, uh, on its hardness, and it will also depend on uh, the milling procedure 
uh, has it been tempered or not? Uh, well, how many sifting steps, how many reduction steps? All of that will impact the damage touch content. But in any case, you will necessarily produce damage, damage touch during milling. It cannot be avoided. And I'm not saying that because damage touch is bad. Actually, damage touch is good and bad. It's, it's all a matter of balance. If it's at optimum level, this is good because damage touch can increase water absorption capacity, uh, which is something that bakers really enjoy in general because that allows them to uh, produce more bread uh, with more water instead of more flour, which are not the same cost. But if you don't control it and you have excess of damage touch, then that can lead to issues, including stickiness including uh, an improper volume on improper geometry of the final product, uh, reddish color, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the thing is that once it has been created, it is extremely difficult and extremely costly to correct as there are no direct um, methods or enzymes to correct the impact of damage touch. So the only way to really deal with this component is to control it. And how to control it <clears throat> is to control it because uh, for any product, there is an optimum level of starch damage that will depend, as I said, uh, on the protein content. If we consider, for instance, a cookie flour, or for making cookies, we want a flour with a low amount of protein, around 8%, let's say. Uh, and because of this low amount of protein, the flour is not able to to retain water a lot into the product. And so if you had too much water, it will leak out. So that means that a cookie flour cannot handle a large amount of damaged starch, only a limited amount. On the contrary, if you are considering a pan bread flour with a higher amount in protein, well, those proteins are then able to, um, to capture the water that uh, is rejected by the damaged starch. Uh, and so you can handle a larger amount of damaged starch, uh, which will increase the water absorption capacity, which can be good, again, without excessive stickiness. So it's all a matter of balance uh, and considering the final product. So knowing that it is quite critical to avoid stickiness, how do we control damage touch? And here the solution that we can offer is a solution that is named the SDMATIC. The SDMATIC is the instrument that, can, that you can see here and that works following an amperometric method. So basically it is based on the, measure, on the measurement of iodine absorption. So I don't know, maybe you've done this experiment in high school when you put a drop of iodine on a potato, slice or on a piece of bread, just like that. And you can see that the iodine turns uh, brown. So at first, when we produce the iodine, uh, as you can see here on the video, it's yellow. It's yellow, but then when we put it in contact with damage touch, it will fix itself to damage touch. So here you can see flower being incorporated and, oh, color is changing <clears throat> because iodine fixes itself to the damage touch. And the more damage starch you have, and the more iodine you will fix to the, uh, to the flower. And so the less iodine will remain at the end of the test. And so this is how uh, we are able to measure the damage starch content here with the estimatic in only 10 minutes and working with only one gram of flour. So very efficient measurement. In order to illustrate that, I would like to show you a quick case study uh, how to avoid stickiness issues during shaping with the estimatic. So this is a study that we have done in uh, 2018 with a French bakery that launched at that time their first range of organic bread. And they were facing fluctuations in the quality of the dough, such as uh, stickiness issues in particular, and of the final product. And uh, they were already uh, controlling uh, alveograph data, farinograph data, and the bakery was also checking the protein content at receptions that was very consistent between 13 and 13.5% 13 for all flowers. Um, and so it was not coming from the protein quality uh, or quantity. Uh, so we wanted to check if it was maybe coming from damaged starch. 
So here the solution was to test 10 flowers uh, with the esthematic and at line. And basically we have classified the flowers based on a bakery observation. Either the flowers were good because they were able to produce a good dough and a good final product, a conform final product, or they were bad, rejected, if you prefer, because they were showing sticky dough uh, during shaping and mixing and an inadequate uh, final product. And just by classifying the flowers like that and making a, not a correlation, but a link uh, with the estimatic data, we were able to show what was the difference, what was the main difference between the two group of flowers. And basically all the good flowers, they were between a specific damage starch range between a 21 and 25 UCD, whilst the bad performing flowers all had a higher uh, damage starch content. And so by doing that, the bakery has been able to set up specifications uh, based on the asthmatic results and so to avoid uh, difficulties during shaping steps due to those stickiness. So that was very efficient. And then we can wonder about tenacity, extensibility, and elasticity of the dough. So what we can say is that those data are actually critical to obtain a proper shape. As uh, in general, we want a dough to be tenacious enough to hold the shape, but without impacting the extensibility, so the ability to stretch out without breaking. And so it should have good extensibility, but also just, just enough elasticity to retain gases, yet expand during proofing and baking while retaining its original or desired form. So again, this is all a matter of balance between different uh, characteristics. But if you have one that is good and the other that is not, you could also consider to add a tenacity to this table. If you have a good extensibility but an improper elasticity, the final shape will be, will be bad. And this is the same thing if you have a bad tenacity with a good extensibility and a good elasticity. And of course, if you have bad everything, you will have bad shape. So you need tenacity, extensibility, and elasticity to be adequate to your process and your product to be able to manage a good shape. Yeah, basically, this is what I've said. Uh, and uh, those parameters, uh, actually, they are mainly dependent on the quality of the protein network, not on the quantity. This is not always related, quantity and quality. So they depend on the quality of the protein network. And here, the solution uh, that we can offer is called the alveograph method. So the alveograph is an equipment that can measure the characteristics of a bubble of dough as it is inflated. So basically, we make a bubble of dough, uh, we push hair we push air, sorry, into the dough, and we measure the evolution of the pressure inside of the dough, of the bubble. And that gives us information about uh, the tenacity, uh, thanks to a value that is called the p-value. Here, we can have the highest point of the curve, which is uh, referred to the tenacity of the dough. Uh, then you have the length of the curve, which refers to the extensibility of the dough, which here represents the maximum volume of air the bubble can contain without breaking. So extensibility it is. Then you have other parameters, uh, one that is very used. This is the W value. And this is the surface under the curve, a very global parameter. And you have another one that is not so used. I will come back on this one a little bit uh, later, but this is very interesting. And this is the elasticity index. And here the elasticity index uh, is, um, represents the resistance to deformation at a specific point of the curve, at 40 millimeter from the beginning of the curve. So at this point, whatever the pressure here, you have 200 milliliter of air inside of the bubble. So this is a way of measuring how the dough, uh, what is the dough curvature? how the pressure decreases after having reached a maximum. And uh, this is actually very interesting. Uh, it is because it is relatively new. And when I say relatively new, I mean it has more than 20 years, but uh, we are working in a very, very conservative uh, field. 
Uh, so it is still relatively new, but because of that, the IAE parameter is often overlooked in specifications. Uh, most frequently in specifications, you can find W value, P by L, but very rarely the IAE value. And this is a shame uh, because this is a very interesting parameter, very unique one uh, that cannot be achieved uh, with other methods. Uh, and so more specifically, uh, what does that mean, this high, this uh, elasticity index value? So here you have two other graph curves, same tenacity, same extensibility. The only difference is how the dough, um, how the uh, pressure decreases after having reached its maximum. And so if we measure the pressure after 40 millimeter here, it is way lower for the blue curve than for the orange one. And what does that mean? Because in any case, at 40 millimeter, the amount of air inside of the bubble is the same, is 200 milliliter, but the pressure is not the same, indicating that the volume of the bubble is not the same. So if the pressure is actually higher, that means that the dough is trying to, um, to resist the deformation, is trying to come back to its initial uh, position, the, do the, the bubble is actually smaller here at the same step than it is here. And this is what we can see uh, here. Same volume of air, but not the same volume of bubble. Um, because of the fact that the dough in one case is trying to come back to its, its original position or a little bit less. And, and this can be directly related, and it's very obvious that we can relate it to, to the shape, actually. Because if the dough is trying to come back to its initial position, then you might have a pizza that is too small. If the elasticity is too important, then you can stretch the dough, uh, stretch the dough and stretch the dough. It will, it will come back, it will stretch back. And if the, 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 the dough of the pizza is too small, well, that can have very important consequences. Uh, for instance, if it's really too small, you might put some tomato sauce online uh, on the pizza, of course, but also around the pizza. Also, it will not fit properly in the box. Another scenario is that you are used to a flower with a certain elasticity and all of a sudden you don't have the same elasticity, you have a lower elasticity. So this would be this case. And the pizza is too big. So first of all, you will not have enough ingredients, enough toppings to have a good uh, pizza in the end. But also you might make a pizza that is so big that it will not enter into the box, into the packaging. And so what do you do with the production in this case? Do you all throw it away? Do you order a new box? What about additional costs? So a very interesting parameter to take into account. And uh, to illustrate a little bit about uh, the, interest, the interest in the alveol when it comes to predicting uh, shape characteristics, here I would like to show you a case study uh, where we wanted to predict uh, the results of two bread making methods. So the AACC Spongendo here, uh, where we wanted to predict the bread volume and the shape ratio. And uh, a, a French uh, method uh, where we, we make a baguette and we want to predict the bread volume and the total score, which is some kind of a global uh, score for the aspect of the product using the alveolar graph method at constant hydration, which is a method that is highly standardized. Uh, if you want more information, here you have the details of the standard. And in order to treat the data, we didn't want to take just one parameter, just the W or just the P or just the, because in the end, the shape, as we have seen, is a conjuncture of all of those data, is a conjuncture of the elasticity and of the tenacity and of the elasticity. And so because of that, we wanted to use all the parameters of the alveolar at the same time, make the best use of those data by using multilinear regressions. A very interesting, innovative approach. Uh, to do so, uh, we organized a unique study setup where we collected uh, wheat uh, from all over the world, 
from uh, 14 countries uh, for a total of 150 samples of wheat from five continents to represent a high viability of quality of uh, geographic origin of um, global characteristics. And so we analyze those wheats with the um, Alveo on one hand and also with other external laboratories to obtain the uh, bread making data. In the end, by using all parameters at the same time, we are able to draw strong correlations uh, between uh, the, um, the actual volume and the predicted volume thanks to the RVO. And here, this is what you can see. Uh, basically, we want the R square here to be as close to one as possible. And when it comes to predicting parameters as complex as bread volume or shape ratio, an R square of 0 0.6 is actually excellent. Here we are clearly able to see a good tendency uh, and to differentiate two types of flower. And so to select flowers, uh, here, if we take those two, uh, here are those two points that you can find also here, uh, we have two different flowers, one from France and one from Kazakhstan. And you can see that because of the quality of the flower, the shape of the final product is actually not the same, even if the same process has been used. And those, this also impacts, well, uh, as you can see, the crumb structure, the color, and uh, other parameters. And this is the same uh, for the French bread making methods. Uh, so here, this is for making baguettes, and here for predicting the volume and the total score. Uh, we have R square of uh, 0 0.7 this time, which is again really, really good when we consider such complex parameters. Uh, and here, same thing with the same flowers as, as before, we are able to really see the impact, predict the impact on the final shape, on some uh, characteristics of the bread. And we can see here, we can also illustrate that uh, the crumb structure is actually really not the same. So here, to conclude a little bit on this study, uh, thanks to the Alveo Lab and to uh, the multilinear regression approach, it has been possible to predict quite accurately uh, the shape characteristics of bread using different uh, bread making methods. And just to let you know, here those are the data that we have used in the models. Uh, and you can notice that the IE value is practically always here indicating that, yeah, this is quite a nice parameter to take into consideration that this is a good prediction. It helps to have a good prediction. This means that thanks to um, this kind of tool, the Alveo Lab allows you to select a flower according to a specific application. Uh, it will allow you to create specification and here, this multi um, parameters approach uh, allow us to say, to recommend that you use different parameters uh, to build your specification as the P value will not be enough to have a proper idea of the final shape. You must consider the P value, you must consider the L value, the IE value, uh, again, a strong recommendation, uh, in order to have your final shape under control. So, uh, in conclusion for this presentation, there are many shaping techniques, as many shaping techniques as you have uh, of final products. Uh, and this is actually a very critical step to master as it defines the final shape of the product, which is, as we have seen, an important aspect for the consumers. But it will also impact many other uh, final product characteristics, uh, such as the cramp structure, such as the quality of the crust. Uh, so very important uh, parameter to control. And also, as we have seen, the shaping step is mainly influenced by the stickiness. And stickiness is mainly impacted by the damage starch content, by the ratio between damage starch and protein. And if proteins is, in general, pretty well uh, controlled, it's not the case of damage starch. And for controlling damage starch, the easiest solution here now on the market would be the estimatic. And when it comes to controlling the tenacity, the extensibility, and the elasticity, uh, those are mainly impacted by the gluten quality. Uh, and it can be very well controlled thanks to uh, the Alveograph method. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, uh, and especially when it comes to shaping, uh, you can also count on other type of solutions that I know I have not described. But uh, as Chopin being part of KPM Analytics, we have uh, sisters companies uh, that design, for instance, uh, machine vision inspection, uh, which are the perfect way to objectively assess a final shape and to make links with rheological data. And not just from the estimatic or the algorithm, you can also consider other solutions here. Uh, I don't have time to describe everything, but uh, do not hesitate to let us know if you have questions, and I would be happy to give you more information. And same apply here for uh, other NIR solution that can be of use to, uh, for instance, predict the protein content. So uh, I would like to really thank you for your attention. I hope this was not too long. Uh, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to try and uh, answer them. So thank you very much. So let me check if we have any questions. Um, what? Where am I? Uh, it seems that I cannot see the uh, Zoom window. Andy, can you tell me if we have any questions? Um, actually, no, not this time. Not this time. No. Well, don't be shy, guys. <laughs> if you have, again, if you have any questions, I would be happy to try and answer. Of course, if I was uh, completely clear, do not, uh, well, that's okay as well. Um, in this case, I will just like to invite you to our next episode, uh, which will be about proofing and which will be uh, held in uh, September, I believe, after, uh, after the crop uh, emergency. So still no questions? No. No questions. That's fine. Well, uh, in this case, I will not make it last too long and uh, wish you all a very good evening, a very good day, depending on your time zone. And uh, I hope to see you next time. Bye.